everyone, and welcome to, yeah, I don't know, it, it just felt right in the moment. Welcome to this week's episode of Certified Forgotten, still the only podcast available on the internet that talks about horror films with 10 or fewer reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. It is a very small niche that not very many people want, but God fucking damn it, it is ours. I am one half of your Matt host, as always, I am Matt Monagle. I am joined by my partner in crime and my partner in protein shakes, Matt Donato. How you doing, buddy? I'm old. I'm, I'm I'm officially old as of today because I woke up and my back hurt for no reason. Uh, that is what happens. You pull things when you're sleeping. I have stretched in the middle. Like, I there have been times where I have like stretched my leg out while I'm sleeping, and I pull something so hard that I wake up, but I'm still too tired to fully wake up. So I'm in this weird liminal state of like, is this going to be a bad time? You have that to look forward to. Whatever lifestyle you're living is catching up with you, friend. But like, I'm still 34, so I'm still fighting it tooth and nail. So like, I still went out for a run today and did all of my workout. I just couldn't breathe sure. during half of it because if I breathed too deeply, there would be a shooting pain in my back and I'd almost collapse. So yeah, everything's going great. Well, I am glad that you're doing well. And I'm glad that you're at the top of your game physically mentally emotionally because we have a really fun guest today and i would hate for you to give them anything less than 100 percent. yeah i don't know if i've ever been on top of any of that game but thank you for that faith in me in any case we do have a wonderful guest that has brought a fucking weird movie that i can't wait to get into later mm -hmm. but first we must intro said guest and said guest is drew deach from the john revision podcast and fin flick podcast so drew welcome how are you doing I'm great. I'm, this is a, honestly, I've been an admirer of this podcast for, for a great while. Uh, you guys, I think do something that speaks to the, uh, the core of my, my movie love, which is, uh, looking for movies and finding little things that people aren't necessarily talking about or have forgotten. Um, I think that's one of the most important things of cultivating a love of movies and certified forgotten is, uh, one of the best at doing it. So I'm happy to be here. Yeah, we always talk about this on, on, maybe not on the podcast, we talk about it a lot during our editing sessions, but of course we run the website as well, which publishes some really good film criticism, which I don't take credit for, it's the, the authors and the writers who pitch us and do good stuff. But the number of times where somebody will pitch us and be like, is this too obscure? This uh, Wes Craven film from that? We're like, no. We're it, like, if you know this, <laughs> if, if it's Tobe Hooper, if it's Wes Craven, if it's John Carpenter, the odds of you getting in the door are pretty small. And you know, the way the one thing we always do say is when you don't care about monetizing what you're doing, you can have a lot of fun and you can talk about a lot of really great movies. I know the exact uh, lane you're talking about, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, it, it, it is um, it, it's something that especially right now, uh, because as we record this, I think we're almost like three months into the WGA strike. It's been like a week since uh, SAG started striking and there's been a take out there that I've seen. Um, where people are saying, you know, it's like, oh, this is so terrible. You know, we're not going to have all this new content. How am I going to, you know, n find things to watch? And it's like, honestly, this is the perfect time to cultivate a a curiosity about looking for movies because um, I, I I I I get very worried about um, you know new generations and how they will find movies and how they'll even be you know interested in them and a big part of, like I said, my love is like, I actually like the search more than a lot of the times I like finding the actual movie and watching it. It's like mm. looking into these things. And, and, uh, I, I think it's, I think you have to have some level of, a of <laughs> like obsession about it because you got to fall down a, a, an IMDB hole or a Wikipedia hole. Like you just mm. look at some director and you're like, Oh, I'm just going to scan through everything they've ever done. And they have 300 credits. And it's like, Oh, Oh, here's something that kind of I've never heard of. Is it available? Nope. Well, I guess I got to go hunting. Let's see if somebody, you know, uh, illegally uploaded it to YouTube and I'll watch that. Um, like that, that, that is actually a, a, a thing I, I would love to see more of because I think ever since streaming kind of took over, people don't like, they're just going to watch whatever's on the, the top banner that's being sold to them. It's like, that's it. I don't have to think, I don't have to look for anything. I don't have to deal with choice paralysis, but I think a way to curb that is with podcasts like, like certified forgotten is like, Hey, the, we trust their, uh, take on stuff. They have interesting things. So why not check out what they say? So, uh, 
I, I, I hope that that's something that can come out of all of this is that we get a generation or, or at least, you know, a small number of people that are like, Hey, I like looking for movies and searching for things. Um, because I think that's what makes you a better appreciator of art in general. Well, because that's the thing that's always correct is it, it, it's out there. Whatever you're looking for is out there. You just have to put the work in and streaming, as you have noted, like makes doing the work obsolete in a way because we have all these streaming services. And why would I go look for something when I can just log into an app? And as you've said, whatever's on the home screen, cool. And hopefully you're doing something like Screenbox or Shutter that is going to cultivate what you need. And like the curation is going to be A plus and you're going to get this rotating door of again, pretty weird ass shit on top of the mainstream on top of everything else. But the reality is the mainstream moviegoer is going to look at Netflix or Hulu um, or they're going to look at Rotten Tomatoes and once again, use it incorrectly because I think Rotten Tomatoes is a great tool that is used so poorly. And that is of not Rotten Tomatoes fault and, and nor is it the people like, like there are just so many problems with today's movie on culture, but the main thing to take away is you need to do the work. I mean, it doesn't get easier. Like, and, and if you don't do the work, it's kind of just embarrassing in a way uh, because like there was a, there was something going on online where a new horror outlet that will go unnamed is positioning itself as the next big, or sorry, not even the next, it's positioning itself as they want to be the only legitimate horror outlet that's doing like, thoughtful horror academic work and thoughtful analysis because horror criticism is dead. And like, that's what they're platforming themselves on right now. And it's okay. like, you just look stupid. If you don't do the work, it like if there is so much brilliant horror criticism out there, there are so many movies you can find out there. Everything is out there. You just have to do the work. And like, I'm sorry that work is hard and I'm sorry that, you know, maybe it doesn't sound super fun, but it's, nothing worth doing is not without sacrifice or hard work. So like, yeah, these movies are out there. Pin, pins out there. Like dude, bro, party Massacre mm -hmm. three is out there. Everything is out there. You just have to go find it. Yeah. And, and, and that's why I say, I think the important thing is to learn to love the, the journey, not the destination uh, as cliche as that is. It's like, no, I like going down into these rabbit holes of like, Oh, you know, I'm going to look at like category three Hong Kong movies from the eighties or something, you know, and just be like, Oh, this is a new, arena for me um and check stuff out uh like right now i'm i'm trying to dig through like a i don't know if obscure is the right word but at least a stuff that wasn't on my radar it's like a, like 80s crime movies um mm -hmm. you know like just stuff that's like oh you know i i i try to cultivate that kind of genre thinking hence uh, why i do a podcast called genre vision it's like okay like i'm uh, you know because i think most people just be like oh i just want to watch a horror movie or oh, i want to watch a comedy um, and I'm like, uh, oh, I'm going to like maybe pick a decade or I'll pick an actor or something and, you know, then start, start looking for stuff. And yeah, I mean, st streaming has just, it's so funny because growing up from the generation that I think we did, uh, I have such magical memories of spending far too long in the video store, you know, just going through and looking at stuff. And you would think that streaming has replicated that feel but because it's digital because it's not you know tactile and because you while you do have a limited option on streaming platforms it doesn't feel like it's limited whereas opposed to the video store it's like this is all you got like you got to pick from this kid like we got to go home and eat dinner um i i just have such fond memories of you know looking at all the the vhs boxes and pulling them out and you know bringing a stack of six of them to my parents being them being like you can get two um and and i i feel that streaming has kind of it's it's tamped down that kind of excitement about just looking for movies mm. um and that's why you know i i one of the reasons why i started genre vision and why podcasts like this i think when it comes to doing the work it's like well there's ways to circumvent that find places like this find the voices that you like and the voices that you learn to trust and take their advice like you know and and here's the thing it's also know that you're going to get burnt. Like you're going to watch a movie that somebody said was really good. And you're going to be like, uh, no, like it wasn't. Um, and learn to be okay with that. And then move on to the next one because it's like recreationally, I watch so many, uh, as I call it, dumpster diving, um, you know, trying to find movies that it's like, okay, here's 
a movie I kind of remember just as a cover as from a VHS, like at the video store. I have no idea about anything about it, but it was a cover I remember. So let's see if I can find a copy of it. Um, and I, I just don't, I, I, you know, I don't know because I'm also, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm in my mid thirties. I don't know how younger generations, you know, is it just, it's just like, okay, whatever the thing is that streaming is telling me I'm supposed to be watching is the thing that they watch. Um, which is one of the reasons why I actually picked, the movie that we're going to talk about today pin because it actually weirdly out of nowhere seemed to crop up with the younger generation on TikTok back in November of 2022. And it, it was this wonderful, like, what, how did they find this? You know, it's, it's one of these, like, I need to know how are their brains working because how did they manage to stumble upon this extremely weird movie? Well, so Drew, normally when we invite a guest on, we'll start by kind of talking a little bit about history, but we're having a really good conversation. And I've had one Sam Adams porch rocker, Lemon Rattler, <laughs> which means I'm feeling great and I'm ready to go wherever this conversation goes. So I want to, I want to pose a question to both of you. How much of that we're, we, you know, I see a lot of people that are on, online and complain about this generation. Oh, Gen Z doesn't care, is incurious, like all of these sort of things. But I do wonder, my personal bias is that you're only as good as the people that teach you. And so how much of this is sort of a failing of, you know, and I won't even say our generation, but working film critics in their 30s and their 40s, like, are we not doing a good enough job of cultivating that interest of teaching folks that it's okay to find complicated and problematic movies? Because I feel like that conversation often turns in both directions to judgment really quickly. You know, are are the kids not all right, or is the industry not really giving them a chance to succeed or to be curious in the way that the three of us grew up being curious? Both of you are like, oh, I have thoughts. Yeah, no, I, I I mean, really quickly, I would say it's not so much a fault of the generation as it is the fault of the delivery system of recommendation. Um, I mean, I was that kid who worked at a video store and told people, it's like, well, you know, if you like this, maybe you like this movie. And, you know, people actually, you know, listen to my recommendations. And it was the same with me. It was like, I found friends that I trusted and, you know, they turned me on to movies and things like that. But, you know, when, when I was coming up, such a big part of it was the, the, the web culture of movie coverage at the time where it was like, you know, you, you, you had, kind of nicher sites that were built upon, Hey, we're just going to like talk about weird creature movies from the seventies or something. Um, and that was that delivery system. But now the delivery system is like, uh, it, uh, like this thing with, with pen was like, people found out about it because they started making TikToks about it. And it's like, well, then maybe it's not so much the, the critical sphere or anything. It really is like, well, just how do you get and it's certainly not the generation that, like you said, they're not at fault. Uh, it's more so like, just how do you get their attention and say like, Hey, here's this thing that you probably don't know about and was made before like 1985 that you should check out. Cause it's, it's pretty much up your alley. Yeah. I, again, I'm blaming the industry. I'm not blaming uh, the generations or anything of that nature, yeah. but I am absolutely going to blame the way that, critics are now forced to write about movies and what movies they write about and what actually does well online because like whether we like it or not we're slaves to the algorithm i mean we only tweet about we only blue sky about what is trending so that we can get uh, 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 uh. it's not called a blue sky <laughs> i'm not saying we only it. Tweet, no. we only tweet about no. we only skate skate motherfucker god damn it skate fine <laughs> we only, skate about. There we we only tweet please continue and skate about what's trending because we want to be part of the conversation we don't, it, it, this is not even like saying us, but I'm just saying the larger we, we don't get rewarded if we talk about the movie that no one has seen yet because no one's going to engage with you. It's the, it's the longstanding conversation of like, I keep seeing people tweet things in the vein of, oh, well, like, why don't we ever talk about, you know, the indie movies that get buried every year? Like, why, why isn't that conversation happening throughout the year? Let me tell you, it is, but no one's engaging with it because everyone else is talking about Halloween. And talking about Friday the 13th. And if I tweet about Halloween Friday the 13th, that will always get me the most engagement on social media. But whenever I like write one of my reviews about, hey, here's this random little low budget horror movie I watched that's actually pretty, pretty rad. 
zero engagement, zero likes, zero anything. So like the idea is the fact that like the algorithm only rewards what is popular. It rewards what people know because that will get more attention than trying to introduce something new into the system. And the other side of that is like, if we really want to talk the inside baseball on this, I mean, writing about indie movies is becoming harder and harder by the day, just by the virtue of once again, by our industry, like a movie like Insidious, the red door, I had to get denied by two major outlets, not because someone else was writing about it, but because it just wasn't big enough for them to write about. They literally Mm. passed on on a review for Insidious, the red door. And finally like pace, like, they were always going to, but like I went to pace and I was like, yeah, like, do you want my review for this? And like, hell hell yeah. Like, why wouldn't we? So like the other part of this is talking about the algorithm in the way it's affecting critics and the way that like, you know, critics deserve to make a living. They deserve to work for actual salaries, but in order to do so now you have to make the company happy and to make the company happy, it is getting harder and harder to write about your personal projects. And you do have to write about whatever is popular. I mean, like, that's what it is. Like, it's coming down to the fact that, like, indie movies are just getting harder to tell people about. And the opportunities to do so are, like, dwindling because there is just no money in this industry that is, you know, very volatile right now. And everyone is very worried about. Like, it, it, it's all fair. All, all, all of it is fair. Everyone's trying to do the best they can. But in the current environment in which people are trying to both discover movies and report on these underseen movies nothing values the underseen and nothing values the discovery everything values oh hey here's a marvel movie we're gonna have 20 think pieces about that because it's all you're gonna fucking click on and i mean that's just true it, it's the reality like no one's at fault it's just it. oh sure I, which is nice because uh i mean obviously i mean covering indie any movies has always been difficult and and something that is always you know those are always the movies that we want to champion because it's like no these are the ones that are interesting voices that are doing something original. It's what you all complain about. There's no originality. Everything's remakes, everything's franchises, but you're not seeing these other little movies. But I think, I think that's why I pivoted more towards digging up movies because there there was a movie I tweeted about uh, the other day that had come across my, my radar uh, that was called white of the eye from I think 1988 with um, Kathy Moriarty. I was like, Oh, I don't know what this is. And it's on screen box. I'm going to watch it. And uh, it was a trip. Like it was a total just like, whoa, what, what is this? I, why is no, it's just one of those, like, why did nobody tell me about this? Um, and I think that's the feeling that people want to feel. And with, with current indie movies, I think that's such a, it, it's such a huge hill to get over, to get people like, Hey, this thing is really something that is different and, and you might be interested in. But when you do it with archival movies and you come out of it of like it's like no you don't understand like there's this thing that's been hiding away for 30 40 years or something uh that you had no idea about and it's why i you know i'm i'm very grateful to like you know all of these boutique uh uh you know physical media uh, labels that it's like hey they they pull out these movies that you know i never heard of before or i had a passing it's like oh yeah i've kind of like seen a poster for that uh, and it was some weird Thai movie from 1981. Um, but I think it's more so it's like, Hey, cultivate checking out all of that kind of stuff instead of just, uh, well, I, I need to see a, a, a good horror movie. It's like, no, cultivate like weird corners, your own weird corners, whatever that may be. It's like, you know, I, I have no dog in the fight of like Hallmark movies. But if somebody came to me and was like, well, actually, there's this Hallmark movie from 1996 that's really weird about like a girl that turns into a crab. I'd be like, all right, like, thank you. Thank you for turning me on to that. Um, More people should know about that. Uh, So I I think so much of it is just trying to find the I mean, you have to be grabby because the algorithm is just going to bury you unless you say the most. I I think for that, why the I movie, I described it as like a UK production in a, a, of an American set desert giallo psycho soap. Like, you know, you just, you just have to go crazy with it. And that's a fair description of that movie. Um, because people nowadays, you, you just can't, everything has to be the wildest. Everything has to be the most, it just has to be the most. So I, I think in encouraging enthusiasm about finding movies, you kind of have to take that hyperbolic stance. Um, it's just part of the deal. But most of the time, it, it's not false. It's like, no, I really feel passionately about this movie that 
I didn't know about until yesterday that just got dug up thanks to vinegar syndrome or Severin or whoever. Um, and, and try and impart that enthusiasm because I think it's the enthusiasm. I think when you talk about critical voice, I think part of the reason people have the perception that they do of critics, um, is that they feel like they're a unified front and they feel like they are just, you know, basically consumer reports people. They're not, you know, I'll, I'll never forget when I was, <laughs> I, uh, I, I worked at a movie theater and was talking about, uh, uh, movies and talking about like, Oh yeah, you know, I'm a rotten tomatoes critic. You know, I've, I've been to this, that, and, and somehow the last Jedi came up and my coworker said like, can you get, can you tell me something? Why did all you critics like that movie? And it was, <laughs> it was this realization of like, Oh, you, you view this as like a, a unified body. And I want to encourage, it's like, no, seek out critics that speak to your specific voice. Um, because they're the ones that are going to help you find the stuff that, you won't find anywhere else. And I mean, it could also be part of the conversation of what is happening right now and what has recently happened where SAG goes on strike and a lot of people are really out of themselves for not knowing the difference between an influencer and a critic. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and the idea of like, yeah, a lot of the mainstream generation now and a lot of the younger generations are depending on influencers because they're fun to follow versus like you know critics of old let's say like who are never going to write in the style that younger generations are ever going to want to read like and again that's all fair like that is all fair and good but once again if you're relying on influencers then influencers are only covering what they're being paid and offered to cover and an indie movie isn't really going to do that you know like, well, and again and influencers are are that's about delivery medium yeah. you know influencers you know to, to get somebody to actually read a wall of text you know on a movie is going to be a lot more difficult for, I think, a younger generation than making a, a, a TikTok video. It's like, I, I remember I went to some uh, event for the first uh, Meg trailer and it was so bizarre because it was like, there were like four critics and like 12 influencers. And it was like, oh man, this is a real almost culture shock for me because mm -hmm. I'm seeing, you know, like just seeing how they operate. It's like, well, I, I can't do that. Like God, Godspeed to y'all, you know, get, get paid. But, um, yeah, that ain't me. And uh, I, I think more and more there needs to be a I think there needs to be a marriage of sorts, um, not so much between critics and influencers, but just a marriage of the delivery medium to younger uh, viewers and a, you know, just a way to stoke curiosity, which is, uh, again, when, when I decided to, to bring pen to y'all, part of it was like back in November, I saw this thing. It's like, yeah, TikTok found this weird Canadian eighties movie and is suddenly making a trend out of it. And I was like, awesome. Great. Like this is, if this is the way we have to, you know, deal with the, like discovering these new movies as they become memes, they become trends because they're so bizarre. I'm all for it. However you get to the movie, I'm okay with as long as it is fueling your curiosity for this kind of stuff. Uh, I'm debating how much I want to go into the um, film critic versus influencer <laughs> Pandora's box that we've opened up here. Yeah, do it. What do you, what do you want to because know? That, what do you want to talk well, about? Well, that's a, no, I think that's, that's like a whole interesting conversation and not in a negative way. Right. Like, no. But like a lot around the notion of, you know, it is, I am too old to pivot to video and I have no interest <laughs> in video. You know, it's not a, it's not a format that I enjoy writing for. I think there's the, the, um, misunderstanding that every film critic has like a screenplay in a shoebox somewhere. Like I don't, I don't, I don't want to make a movie. I don't care about making movies. It's not a thing that I want to do. So I, when I think about, you know, YouTube, um, even really good, like every frame of painting, right? Like YouTube um, critics, people that are writing like long form video content or short form TikTok content. You know, I, I think that the, the, those mediums are a little bit even too nascent in a way for us to, to really have a sense of what that could be because there are folks that I follow on TikTok that are journalists. And there are folks that I follow on TikTok that are influencers and it boils down to, to who's paying you. Right. And like mm -hmm. who, you're, who you're beholden to, but there are influencers I follow that are much better at what they do than journalists that I follow. There are people who care and put in the time and the work. And it just so happens that their paycheck is being signed by the studio directly, not the outlet that's being wined and dined by the studio. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, it's, it, it can get, get muddy, but I am, I'm, I'd like to see 
how a generation raised on short form video content finds their voice as film critics in this new medium. Cause I think you're absolutely right. You're like, there are going to be people that are basically doing like 30 second TikTok blasts of like really incredible film criticism. I think of a culture writer who also has a, a podcast that I follow, uh, Jamel Bowie, who writes for the New York Times. And he has a podcast where he goes through like 90s war and military films basically as an exploration of, you know, American foreign policy. Very, very much a, a journalist. But when he gets on TikTok and he's like talking to the camera about stuff too, that line, super blurred. So it's mm-hmm. just kind of, it, it is a thing that I can talk myself in circles around a little bit because I think that those barriers are solid, but I think they're a little permeable in both directions. I think sometimes what we do as journalists is basically just like talking up shit that we love um, and having opportunities to get like free DVDs in the mail. I'm not saying it's not journalism. I'm just saying there's a lot of gray area there. And I do feel like when folks look at that and be like, the studio sent you to a set visit and then they gave you a copy of some deluxe package on Blu-ray. How's that any different than getting $200? I'm like, it is, but I get that you don't think that. Yeah, I, but the the black rose that I got delivered for the conjuring, the devil made me do it, is very different than getting two hundred dollars in my bank account. Yeah. Um, so, but no, I, I I think it's just so much about you know not not like even removed from the critics influencers thing. It's so much more about how do young people discover content that isn't being directly marketed to them by a corporation. Yeah, like amen. that that that's the big because of course they they're, they're going to be aware of the Barbies and Oppenheimers and mission impossibles. Like there's no escaping that because they're going to be marketed to on every social media platform. It's more so it's like, well, that's why this time is so interesting and why I'm trying to like push my agenda of like, now is the time go out there and search for movies, like cultivate the love of searching for it because I don't, I, I don't know like how a young generation does that like is is it just through TikTok memes and you know things like that? Um, and if it is okay, like I I don't care about how it gets to them. It's just a matter of how do you do it and how do you try and it, it, it's it's so much more about not how do you get to them. It's how do you get to them and then make it so that they want to like Donato saying in some way you got to do some work. You have to go out searching for yourself. You have to go out. And sometimes that does mean like in the current landscape, it's like, all right, you're going to spend 20 minutes on the streaming service of your choice, go to some genre and just start going through and add things to your, to your watch list. Um, But if it's not that, then it is like, Hey, just find different avenues of, of how to find these kinds of weird movies. Cause I mean, the, it's not like the opportunities and the voices aren't out there. They are, they're everywhere. Like from, from the lowliest YouTube critic who's getting seven views on his review of some, you know, Blu-ray, like it's there. You just have to look for it. Well, and I'll throw out an example um, to me of, of something that blurs the line a little bit. It's like, I fucking love letterbox. I use letterbox all the time mm-hmm. and they have, they have like coverage teams and editorial team. They do those red carpet interviews where they're asking filmmakers what their and talent, what their favorite films are. And I think that is a great way for new generations to discover every time they do like the red carpet for asteroid city and Tom Hanks is talking passionately about the five films he could watch again and again. Mm-hmm. I think that's great. But letterbox is, isn't a public third party publication. It's not a neutral publication. It, it's publicity at the end of the day. And so, you know, I, I, I don't mean to muddy the waters unintentionally, but it, it's as a, if I were 16 today, knowing how I was when I was 16 back then, I would have a really fucking hard time navigating the entertainment industry right now. I really, really would. Yeah. I, I think that's a, a, obviously a developed cynicism towards it. Like, you know, when, when it's like, why did all you critics like the last Jedi? I was like, well, we did, we didn't all get together and decide, you know, in the, in the meeting that we have for every movie, like, all right, we're going to like this one. Um, it, it, there is this cynicism. And I think obviously there's a lot of, I think the dangerous thing about it is that, the discussion around movies has become so deliberately bad faith politicized on so many social media platforms. Like YouTube is a nightmare of that oh, stuff. Yeah. And, and I, and I, that's the thing that I worry about is like, Oh, well people are going to, especially younger people are going to cultivate their, their movie taste and, and movie brain essentially on that kind of stuff instead of just the, 
the celebratory, you know, just like, Hey, no, just who cares if movies are bad or they have politics that you don't agree with. The point is like, just keep looking, keep searching, keep, keep trying to find stuff that appeals to you, but also that you, you need to expand. I, 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 I will give Netflix this, um, a huge part of my film education was when Netflix was allowing, you know, their male DVDs. And that was just a huge, like, all right, you know what? I have this huge library available, available to me. I'm going to watch movies. I would never watch like on my own, just, you know, personal time of like, Oh, you know, leisure stuff. It's like, no, I, I want to educate myself. And I think that's the line that at some point you have to cross as somebody, if you really love movies as an art form is like, at some point you have to admit that, some movies are not going to be just entertainment. They are going to be educational for historical reasons, for whatever. It's like, yeah, did I like really want to sit through Andre Rublev? Like, no, but then I watched and I was like, I got a lot out of that movie. Like yeah. by sitting, it's like, because it's like, no, this, it's not the movie. I'm, it's like, oh guys, come over. We're going to have the Andre Rublev watch party and, and live tweet it. But it's like, no, I sat and I learned things about, you know, international cinema. I, I think that's one of the biggest things that I, I try to encourage is like, trust me, you all have no idea what kind of movies are out there when you get out of your particular, you know, uh, English speaking bubble, because there's an incredible plethora of movies from decades. And like I, a big part of, of, of what we've fallen in love with in genre vision is like Hong Kong cinema from the seventies, eighties and nineties. It's like, wow, there's just all these movies that were never on my radar growing up. And, and now it's like a whole new treasure trove is opened up to me. Um, and you know, how to get that to younger people to be like, Hey, do that. Like, look for, look for weird Japanese movies or, you know, look for, uh, uh, movies from France or, 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 or Germany or something and look for stuff that's in your interest. If it's horror, go into horror. If it's, you know, comedy or action, there's so much stuff out there. And I would, I would love to see more of that attitude uh, directed at younger people. Just it's like, Hey, and, and again, you know, cause I'll, I'll, I'll toot you guys as horn. That's why I think shows like this are important because it's like, Hey, it's, I understand it's tough to navigate out there, but if you find the right voice, click into it. And we've got to, we've got to pivot and talk about uh, today's film, but before we do Donato, any, any last thoughts? Cause we've been, cutting through a lot of a lot of red meat there i think yeah i mean just really quickly just touching on a few things uh so social media has changed criticism for the better and the worse rotten tomatoes has changed criticism for the better and the worse uh it's all about how we as critics evolve with that and are able to both keep our integrity and do what is correct for criticism but also go to the next platform because i mean at the end of the day like yeah, I do do live streams of Perry and stuff like that. I do do video. And when I go there, though, I'm not changing myself. And my problem is seeing certain people who realize what they can get out of being influencers and how that has softened their criticisms and things of that nature versus the influencers who, again, like what they're doing is legitimate. I, I think, like you said, Monogal, like there's there's muddy waters there, but, you know, at the end of the day, there is a huge difference between an influencer and a critic, and like more people have to understand that. And the yeah. problem is how we are getting criticism and influencers mixed up and how we can stop that. That I think that will clear up a lot of issues. But at the moment, studios love influencers more, so what the fuck are we going to do? Talk about pen, that's what. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, you know, hey, we didn't we didn't talk. I think this is a situation where we did not get the the, you know, uh, evolution drew of you as, as a horror lover and a film critic. But I think anybody that heard what you had to say over that last half hour definitely understands your, your essence and your love of, of horror and will definitely appreciate where you're coming from. So did we, did we do the, uh, the letter of the law? No, but I think we captured the, the spirit of the law. In the I certainly part. hope so. Well, cause I, I think that's part. It's like, Hey, if you, if, if the spirit comes across and if one person gets influenced by it, I'm sorry, I'm not an influencer. If you know, uh, if you get, <laughs> It, it, you know, if it if it pushes you into like, hey, I'm going to try and seek out more movies, then that's what matters. Like, I just I just want people to enjoy looking for movies because I feel like there's a definitely a, a, a dearth of enjoyment when it comes to having to search for movies. 
And now that we've had an existential crisis about the nature of film and film <laughs> criticism, let's talk about Pin, a movie about the world's most fuckable medical doll. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. And now is the time on the episode where we're going to talk about Pin, which Drew has brought for us. A quick couple sentences on the movie. Um, it is streaming on YouTube in a late night uh, Joe Bob Briggs kind of YouTube variety show sort of thing. If you look for it, you'll find it. But if you want to pause and go watch the movie, now's the time. If you're just here for a brief description and our unhinged reactions to the movie... <laughs> Directed by physician turned filmmaker Sander Stern, Pin is the story of two children and their heartfelt friendship with uh, an anatomically correct doll. As children, Leon and Ursula are taught the birds and the bees from their physician father, played by Lost Star Terry O'Quinn, of course, and Pin, the medical dummy he brings to life through ventriloquism. But as the children grow older, Leon obsesses over his relationship with Pin. Soon he is providing the voice for Pin and speaking in full conversations with the dummy. When their parents die, the two siblings are left to manage the estate alone, and Leon and Pin work together to ensure Ursula will never, ever leave them. That's a very good synopsis. Bravo. It's a, I, it makes it sound a lot more logical than, than I think it is in some places. But, oh, we got some shit to talk about today. <laughs> Drew, let's start with the, uh, with the recommendation. You brought this film to us. You've talked about, obviously, you probably had a lot of options um, when you were going through <laughs> things that qualified for our categories of movies, what made you land on pin is the thing you want to talk about other than the TikTok YouTube trend. Yeah. I mean that, that was certainly kind of a, something that's been stuck in my brain since it happened back in November. But uh, like pin, I, I did an episode of pin on, on, on my show genre vision, but it was a, it was a versus episode with bride of Chucky and, and I love bride of Chucky, but it was also just like, I, I, I wanted more time to talk about pin. Um, and so I, I saw that as an op this as an opportunity to do that and also to revisit the movie because uh, for the first time I had read the novel that it was based on um, the, the novels by Andrew uh, Niederman, who's probably uh, I, he also wrote The Devil's Advocate, but he's probably best known for being the ghostwriter for V.C. Andrews, also wrote her uh, autobiography, uh, The Woman in the Attic. Um, and so if you know that, it's like, yeah, uh, he tends to write some pretty icky stuff is how I would describe it. Um, icky, uncomfortable, psychosexual. And, uh, I, I had wanted to revisit this because I was able to, uh, obtain a copy of the movie that also had a commentary from the, uh, writer, director, Sanders Stern. Uh, so it was an opportunity to learn some more about this weird little movie that I am I'm, I'm so shocked because I was like, oh, I'm going to look up pin on Rotten Tomatoes. It won't work. Like, you know, there'll be more than 10 reviews, critic reviews. There are two critic reviews for this movie. I think there's like 2,500 plus audience <laughs> reviews. And I'm wondering if that's because last November, uh, TikTok got a hold of it. Also, um, hey, I'm sorry, Joe, I got to interrupt you real quick. Shout out to a friend of the podcast, Xena, for being one of the two. Uh, ah. I saw that. I was really like, oh, of course, of course, Xena is one of the two folks on here. That's awesome. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, but yeah, th this was, a an opportunity to revisit the movie for the first time since I had read the novel, um, and to hear Sandor Stern, uh, since he was the screenwriter, which I, I guess most people would probably know him as the screenwriter for the Amityville horror. Uh, he also co-wrote and directed Amityville for the evil escapes, AKA Amityville lamp. Um, and this was a, an interesting project for him because he's mostly known as a, as a TV movie director. And this was his one chance to make a, or at least his first chance to really make a theatrically distributed film. And as such, it meant that he did not have to worry about network censors or standards and practices. And he had tucked away an adaptation of this because he, he got a copy of the book back when it was still um, uh, in galley and, and uh, wrote a script in like 1982 and the movie uh, shot in 87 and it was according to him something that he got to just no studio really interfered with it he didn't have to change his script he really got to make the thing he wanted to make which means he got to make an extremely 
uncomfortable, disturbing, uh, but I would say effectively disturbing little psychological horror film. Donato? Yeah, I, I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> like, I, like, that is legitimate reaction, even from me, the person who is championing what the fuck at every turn. There are elements here that are better than they should be. I was not expecting them to be because once again, there is like incestuous rape talk going on. There is poetry, rape, sorry, poetry. Yes. yes. Incestuous, which is very funny because, because apparently Niederman and Stern were at a screening for, and they had like a focus group screening and they got a little card back and somebody was like, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely appalled at this because this is, you know, an an, an incest movie. And Sanders Stern turned Andrew is like, is this an incest story? And, and Niederman's like, no, like there's no incest in it. Like, and it's like, well, technically you are right. Like no incest occurs. Um, but it's very clear that, uh, David Hewlett's character, Leon, uh, if, if, if he doesn't lust after his sister, he just wants to dominate her wholly. Like he wants to control her. And part of that then involves their, their sexual development. And, um, you know, in, in the movie, Stern makes a lot of really, I think, key changes from the novel that actually benefits Ursula's character. Um, Because in the movie, there's a very divergent point where Ursula realizes that her father provides the voice for Penn and realizes, like, okay, this is not, I I understand what's going on here. Uh, Whereas Leon believes it wholly and and that eventually feeds into his his schizophrenia. And, and I, I just, (laughs) it's amazing that as dark and icky as the book is, the movie still manages to have so many moments that are effectively uncomfortable. And unless, uh, unless there was not a, a topless scene in this movie, I wonder if this would have gotten away with not having an R rating because it's like, well, it, there's not like gore in it. There's no excessive profanity, but the subject material is so uncomfortable that I think it would be one of those cases where they're like, yeah, we're just rating it R for like suggestive themes or something. Like mm-hmm. They'd make some excuse because it's so out there. Yeah, there, there's a little doll humping a la Silent Night, Deadly Night 5. But like outside of that, like, correct, the, there is not that much gore. There's not that much of those things. But so I just watched, I rewatched last night, Mother May I, which is a brand new movie starring Kyle Gallner and Holland Roden. And what I like about that movie so much is this vagueness about whether it is, whether it's about a woman who is cosplaying her partner's dead mother, or if she's actually possessed by the dead mother. That Mm. is the entirety of Mother May I, and it's very good. And I like it, once again, because of that vagueness and the way that movie teases you ever so slightly to make it look like there could be a ghost there and there could be a possession element but also it like clearly shows you like no this is just reality and there's some psychotherapy things happening here in the wrong way i take that into pin because i get that same split in pin where Mm. i think effectively it is going through this very absurd scenario of ventriloquism and somebody using this medical doll to basically justify their own insane inhibitions and things of that nature. But at the same time, there are little elements here and there that do make you think like, okay, is there something more here? Is there the supernatural element or anything of that nature? So to toe that line and to have that little bit of uncertainty, I think helps this film so tremendously because it does it does keep you guessing a little bit. You're you're waiting for like Pin to get up and actually do it right. himself and actually like be the monster we think he is. So I, I that would to me was way more successfully done than I was expecting. Yeah, it's it's uh it's 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 great that you mentioned that because you know Sanders Stern says it's like no, there's nothing supernatural going on, but we deliberately put in little uh, little bits of ambiguity just to kind of mess with you. For example, um, when Terry O'Quinn uh, catches uh, Leon talking to Penn and he's going to throw him out. So he, he's like, oh, I'm going to take him and, and, and give him off to a, a, a medical facility or whatever for a teaching aid. And he's in the car. He's 
got the, 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 he's got pen in the back and pin is in the rear view mirror. And Terry O'Quinn moves the, the mirror to stop. So he won't be in his view. And then he looks back and pins right back looking at him again. And it's like, Oh, well, like did he shift while they were driving or what's going on here? Uh, but I like that the movie plays with little moments of that, but still you could go through and justify. It's like, Nope, there, there you can justify every little moment of ambiguity with something, you know, practical and grounded, but I like that ambiguity being there because it adds a level of, I think it adds a level of creepiness to it. Um, uh, I, I think the, the best, I would say the best performance in the movie, and I think it's a, a pretty well acted movie, uh, is actually the voice of Penn played by Jonathan Banks, um, which is a total shocker when I found out about that. It's like, my, Mike, Mike is, is Penn. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's a, it's a great decision not to have the voice be Terry O'Quinn's or David Hewlett's that adds another level of like, yeah. it's something else removed. It's something different. So it could be, it's like, is like for all intents and purposes, that's Penn's voice. You know, part of the reason I love doing this podcast is um, it reminds me in the best possible way of being in college in that I get to be in a room with other people who are processing the same thing that I'm trying to process. (laughs) And what they're saying helps me clarify my own opinions Mm. on the thing in question. And that is a build up to the fact that I really like this movie. I like this movie a lot. And I don't even think I realized I knew that I liked it. And I was like, what is it about this film? It was when both of you were talking about, um, you know, the way that they're using pin, you know, I think that there's one of the most fun things in film or theater or whatever is like comedies that are, that present as tragedies or tragedies that present as comedies. And I think this is a really interesting example of a tragedy that presents as a horror film. Cause I think you're right. The film itself on the type, unlike the filmic level is doing everything it can to create sort of this ambiguity. But when you think about what the underlying story is, there are all these elements of father, who is uncomfortable having frank conversations with his kids about sex, who creates this barrier between the two of them. You think of the the character of Leon, who, you know, the, who is demonstrating what a physician would understand to be early signs of mental illness. And that Terry O'Quinn's character in that moment panics, not because Pin is evil and alive, but because he doesn't know how to deal with what he's seeing from his son. It's too scary. It's too overwhelming for him. He can't so confront he, it he freaks out and tries to take pin away. This is a horribly tragic film Mm. that presents as a horror film. And I fucking love that. Yeah. I I, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's a tragedy. Like, and, and what's interesting is the, the only scene that, uh, the producer, um, uh, Pierre David made them reshoot is the scene where pin is chasing the, uh, the woman that Leon brings over to sleep with. Um, and that's like the one like outright, like horror horror movie thing. And it goes on like a little too long because it's like, Oh, this needs to be the horror chase scene. But the, the scene, the scene that just continually, it's the scene that I always think about from this movie that, that always creeps me out is when after their parents have died in the uh, car accident, uh, their aunt Dorothy comes to live with them. And Leon is very much like, I don't think aunt Dorothy is going to be around for too long. And she's sleeping in her room and pin uh, is in the room and we just hear him going, Dorothy, I'm right behind you. And it's like, that's it. it. It's honestly such simple horror to, it's like, you don't see, I mean, eventually, yes, you see pin rise up and that's a wonderful moment of like, Oh, what's going on. But it is just the simple, it's just a creepy voice saying that it's right behind you. It's very simple horror tools being weaved in through this much more complicated and and sticky psychological tragedy between these two siblings um it, it, it's it's one it's a wonderful marriage of the two and and, and like you're saying um it it is a horror movie but it's kind of a horror movie by necessity because like they had to say like the Pierre David was very angry at Sandor Stern when he was watching dailies. He's like, this isn't the movie I sold. You didn't make the movie I sold. And it's like, cause you sold it as a scary horror movie. And it's like, well, there there's elements of that, but it is really a psychological drama. Yeah. I, I so I like the game of it though. And I feel like pin the movie is playing 
a game with the audience where to go back to what I was saying before and you don't know if Pin is alive in some possessed mm-hmm. state or just, you know, a doll that is being used with ventriloquist uh, to speak. But that scene that you were talking about is one I want to bring up too because the way that it elongates the right amount of time where you don't see Leon at all and you just see Pin rising up, you just see, like, you think this is finally going to be a moment when you find out Pin is real and you don't but that's not a bad thing for me for some reason like it's not like you've you've told me something that isn't true about the film but instead you keep using this little ruse that becomes so like all right is this going to be the time wait is this going to be the time we are just waiting and waiting and waiting for pin to come to life and he never does and i think that is such a fun game that the movie plays with the audience whether that is the chase sequence, whether that is the bedroom sequence, whether it is numerous other sequences where you're just like, this is going to be the time, like Pin's mouth is going to move and say something and it never happens. And I think lesser films would have been able to get away with that where Pin is just absurd enough and the performance behind Leon is good enough in his sister wanna fuck ways. Like, all of that coming together in such distress and such just like psychosis. I don't know. Like it, it's, it's fun. And that's weird to say about yeah. this movie, but it's a fun game. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's a fun, it's fun in the same kind of thriller way. And in, in that you're like, you are, it's like, you're waiting to find out, well, what, what's the, when's the next shoe going to drop? Because I think the movie is extremely expert at building to its final scene because Pin comes to life in the final scene and it's the yes. tragedy. Like that's the tragedy is like, yes, pin is real now at, at, at a very steep cost, but I just love there. There's so many small moments in the movie that earn that uh, one of them is just a single shot. It's a, uh, it's just like the, the, the camera doing like a, a pedestal, like a boom shot. And it's Leon sitting in the attic facing pin and pin is just telling us like, Oh, aunt Dorothy, she's going to turn everything into what it was before. And I love that Banks's vocal performance changes over time. And specifically when Leon starts doing the voice, um, he becomes more aggressive. He becomes more confrontational with Leon. Um, There's a nice little thing because the reason he's called pin is he was named Pinocchio by Ursula when she was little. And uh, it was because his nose never grew because he never told a lie. And when, during the end sequence uh, or the kind of the final stages of the movie, when Leon is trying to get rid of Ursula's new boyfriend, Stan, um, he is trying to lie to her and saying like, you know, he came over and, you know, he had an argument with Penn and Penn calls him. I was like, you can't lie like Leon because I can't lie. So that's why you're so bad at it. Um, It's a, and I, I think Hewlett's performance, this was, I think his second, feature film and his first lead performance. And he's just, you know, he's a beloved character actor. Um, loved him in that Guillermo del Toro cabinet of curiosities episode, the graveyard rats. Um, and I think he's just so tapped into exactly the wavelength that the movie needs to work. Um, because as, as despicable as he gets, he is a, a pitiful, sad character. And in, on some level, it's like a Norman Bates type thing where it's like, well, yes, this person is is doing very bad things, but we understand why they're doing them. And it it's a there's a sadness to it. I'm not obviously it doesn't excuse what they're doing, but it is still like, hey, this person is damaged. And because of the way that they were raised and because they never got the the love or the attention or the assistance or, you know, uh, 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 institutional help that they clearly need it's evolved into this thing that has just, you know, gone off the track. And I think, I think Hewlett plays that so well. And I think it's a performance that some people might downplay. And it's like, I I think he's tapped into just the right energy. And I'm glad you brought that up, Drew, because I think I remember there being a point about halfway through the film where I was like, I know Pin is supposed to be maybe a, a monster or maybe a manifestation, but like he makes a lot of fucking sense. Like you're listening to everything that Pin has to say and he's actually a pretty trustworthy confidant for most of the film, other than when, you know, uh, Leon's kind of putting his thumb on the scale of what Pin's advice is. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think that that's, that, that speaks to another thing that I really fascinated me is that like a lot of these films, you know, are about 
ignorance, right? Like a character sees something that they don't understand. And then in the parlance of 1980s horror psychology, they immediately, you know, go crazy, start killing folks. It's pure Freudism. It is at its absolute worst in its most pop culture. And I think part of what I find interesting about this film too, is that everybody has a level of pragmatism about things that most horror films aren't. You know, Ursula has an abortion early in the film, and that is a very matter of fact process um, for both her and for the father. I mean, it's emotional and loaded and, but like, it is not, it is not some grand, horrible thing. You know, there is no, your condemnations, you're going to hell. I think that Leon has a strong understanding of a lot of um, what's going on. I think there's a part of him that is self-aware that, that something is, is not right, that he's not responding or connecting in the way that, that other folks might. But I think that's part of what I, I I love about this movie is the um the fact that these are these are characters who not should know better, but who understand on some level that things aren't right and can't help themselves, are compelled to do the things, whether it is continue to talk to Penn if you're Leon, whether it's continue to carve out space for this fantasy if for Leon if you're Ursula. And again, that's just I I fucking love a good tragedy. I love a good horror tragedy. And the the fact that these are not stupid characters, that these are not misguided or misled characters, they're characters who are broken and are turning to things that they shouldn't for salvation under like eyes wide open, fully understanding in their own way, what they're doing. Um, that's sad. And that's great. That makes yeah. Great. I, I, I really like, um, because the, the, I won't spoil anything from the book if any listeners or anybody wants to read because I do recommend the book. If you liked the movie, definitely check out the book. I, I can't say which one's better than the other, but the book is a lot. Uh, it's a lot darker. And the relationship between Leon and Ursula, um, I'll, I'll give one example that they changed in the in the movie. Uh, Leon's first real understanding of sex is when he is sneaking into the doctor's office to talk to Penn and he sees a nurse go to town on pin and uh, he does not react positively uh, in the book. That is Ursula. And it is at the guidance of Leon. They are having a, 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 a an awakening moment in their uh, youth to this. And it is much more, their tragedy is tied in together because in the movie, Ursula grows and she eventually gets to this point of like, look, I, you know, I, I love him. He's my brother and he's my best friend and I'm just trying to keep him safe. He's, you know, I don't believe he's hurting anybody until she finds out that he is. Um, but by the end of the movie, it's clear, uh, I, they don't give a timestamp at the end, but, uh, her boyfriend, Stan Fraker, who, uh, uh, Leon attempts to murder, but survives, when she comes back, the caretaker that's there at the house says like, oh, Mrs. Fraker, I didn't hear you come in. It's like, oh, okay, so she's gotten married. She has clearly left this house um, and she's coming back. And the ending where she goes up to visit Penn, uh, which in, in the opening, I mean, if if you see the opening, which is another thing that's invented for the movie where a bunch, of, it's that one, one of my favorite stock scenes of a bunch of kids outside of the haunted house being like, come on, go in there. And, uh, you, you see that it's like, okay, that is Leon who we, who we will come to know as Leon, but that ending where she's talking to Penn and, and he says like, have you heard from Leon? I miss him greatly. It's like, man, that the journey that you've been on as dark and weird and fucked up and, and uncomfortable as it is that final moment of realizing that there is no more Leon, you know, there is no Leon, only Penn is totally effective i think it's a it's a wonderful gut punch gut punch ending um that still allows ursula it's like you know what ursula ursula grew ursula was able to escape this she's clearly living a a functional life uh and then there's pin um yeah it's it's a it is i think a movie that it's so interesting because just a i think one of the reasons why it's been forgotten or not accessed was because it was originally going to be distributed in theaters in the U S by new world, uh, Roger Corman's company. And, uh, well then new world decided not to do it. And then it didn't get theatrical distribution. And now it just floundered and never got kind of the eyeballs that I think it deserved. I want to follow up on that drew, because we usually end the podcast with talking about the opportunity for these films to be rediscovered. But I have I have one last question that I want to ask Donato, and then Drew, of course, you can answer it too. 
Donata, you, as everybody knows, write a column called Revenge of the Remakes. You are also a pure slasher, like campy 80s bro. You have seen a lot of really bad, not you personally, but like the kind of movies you consume. You've seen a lot of really bad boyfriends on film. I am utterly fucking fascinated by the character of Stan and what he represents, especially for the period that this movie came out. Talk to me about Stan. I want to know your thoughts on Stan because he's such an interesting fucking character. Wait, I, I now I want to hear you first, though, very quickly, because like, you know, talking about Stan. So how did you read his actions? What do you what do you mean? Explain yourself very quickly. I, you know, I think hashtag justice for Stan. I think that he <laughs> may be my personal read is that he may be one of the best boyfriends to ever grace a horror film. He's yeah. really good, right? He, yeah, he's a really he, good guy. He he's super supportive. He's he's cute. Not I mean, he's a good looking guy, but I mean, he's very cute emotionally towards Ursula. Like their mm-hmm. meet cute is great because she's going to the library to read up on schizophrenia, and he's there. You know, she eventually gets a job there, and he's like, "Hey, uh, uh, where's this section?" She's like, "Oh, it's there in the back." Oh, okay. Hey, could you tell me what time it is? And there's a clock right behind it. It's like, oh, he's a really nice guy. He's he's got a little bit of himbo energy, I would say, um, in in the best of ways. But uh, he he is just a he's very accepting, at, you know, of when he comes over for dinner. <laughs> and, um, he bring, what 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 I would say is he brings remake energy to the original, which was my kick to you, Donato. Yeah, mm. it, very much just the sense that he sat there the whole time as this normal ass dude just trying to be a good boyfriend. As Leon is again reading his very very disturbing poetry. And like, he doesn't break in the moment. He like, you know, Leon does his thing. Leon goes back and talks to Pin and is like, oh my God, I've read some of my poetry and he likes it. And, you know, the fact that he didn't just jump across the table at that moment and be like, yo, what the fuck? Like that is alone amazing. But yeah, just to bring up what Drew just said, then he gets invited for a special surprise by Leon and he just comes right over. He's like, oh yeah, sure, I'll do anything. And it's like- I, I love I love the initial interaction between Stan and Pin because if you watch Hewlett, and Leon is a character. He's clearly waiting like, oh, Penn's going to, he's not going to take to this guy. But then Penn's really nice to him. He's like, oh, thank you so much for the chocolate, Stan. I love them. And it's like, oh, this adds more to that of like, well, it's not just uh, Leon voicing himself through Penn. Penn is another personality and Penn is being very accepting of Stan at first. Yeah, just, um, justice for Stan. I agree with that. Well, I, I, I'm glad that Stan, Stan does uh, uh, live in this, thankfully, and, and gets married. It would have been nice to see him in the end. Um, he has a very different fate in, in the book um, and some very different. Like he's like a Vietnam vet in the book and he has like a wooden leg, uh, some some weirder stuff. Amazing. Um, amazing. But uh, <laughs> I mean, and the wooden leg comes into play uh, as far as a um, plot device. Chekhov's um, wooden leg, of course. Yes. Um, but yeah, like Stan, Stan is a. Uh, Stan's a good guy. Like it, he's not, he's not sex crazed. You know, he's not some horn dog. Like that's after Ursula. He just is a really, really nice guy who just happened to uh, find himself in the midst of the most fucked up possible family. Good. I'm glad that we, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about Stan before we ended because I just, he's, he's my favorite partner. Um, male partner in, in horror history, I think because of how he handles the most impossible situation. So I found, I, I was very, very enamored with what they do with that character and then the performance It all came together for me. Well, that brings me to our last question. The one we always ask our guests, which is how does a movie like this become uncertified forgotten? How does it find its audience? Um, will it have an audience or is it always going to be a curio that might pop up every couple of years on TikTok where somebody with a particularly <laughs> big audience is looking for something that they can talk about that's going to catch people a little sideways. So Drew, we'll start with you. Does this film have a future outside of folks like us? God, I hope so. I mean, th- thankfully, I was so surprised to see that this did not have more critical reviews on Rotten Tomatoes because it's it's actually fairly well regarded as a cult classic, but because it did not get theatrical distribution in the U.S., that cut off such a big part of its potential pop culture impact. It, it went direct to video in the U.S. It had a very limited um, theatrical run in Canada. I want to say it like played like a weekend in like 10 theaters or something. Um, and so it has thankfully been discovered, I think, partially just based on the quality of it. But there's a lot of talented people that, you know, eventually went on to, uh, you know, uh, different levels of fame and notoriety. Um 
I, I think that Hopefully, I, as last I looked, there was supposedly supposed to be a German Blu-ray restoration of it coming out soon, but I don't know the uh, the the truth of that or not. But this is a movie that is just begging for some boutique label to pick up, to find a good print and clean it up, um, because unfortunately, like you just you know the the quality that the the, the movie is in right now is certainly watchable, but it, you know it's not some incredible cinematic masterpiece in terms of the uh, the way it looks but it's such a solid movie it's so solid in its construction when it comes to the actual cinema of it and i i hope and pray i you know i, I it's all going to come down to rights issues i'm sure that somebody will pick this up because i think as soon as you restore this you will find out that if justin because apparently this is fairly established as a cult classic in Canada, like the Canadian audience. Like I, I saw responses on social media when Donato and was, was tweeting about it and people were just like, oh, yes, the ca- a Canadian classic. Um, and they were all Canadians. So that kind yeah. of, <laughs> so, so it's like, yes, I, I, I do think that all it's going to take is that, is that one label that gets the rights that cleans it up. Um, the DVD release that, that did happen came from anchor Bay in the two thousands and the, you know, they got a nice commentary track. Um, you know, I think it's just treating the movie with the love it deserves. And I can guarantee you, like when the, the disc announcement comes out, it's like, oh, here's pin on Blu-ray or 4k. You'll all of a sudden see these people popping up, you know, like prairie dogs, just all of a sudden like pin, 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 pin. And you'll find out that I think this movie has more of an imprint than it's rotten tomatoes, uh, number of critics reviews would lead you to believe. Yeah. What do you think? You agree? Yeah, the boutique thing is where it's at, because if it's already had its TikTok discovery, I mean, the fact that it even made it to TikTok somehow, I think is a little bit of a minor miracle. You think of what TikTok did for movies like Skinamarink and things of that Mm -hmm. nature. So like TikTok can be a force of good. And if it has already discovered Pin, I feel like that rediscovery period is very much over. Uh, But at the same time, I think it is begging for that boutique release because if there is no remaster, there is no, you know, proper version out there to actually own and like that collectors would love because that's all it takes. You get the collectors buying it. They start showing their friends. They show their like it's just the domino effect after that. So until then, uh, you know, the fact that we had to watch this on, again, some like Sven Gulli knockoffs YouTube channel uh, just to <laughs> just to see it it's a little harder like you know it's a little harder so it needs to actually have channels that are more than youtube (laughs) i skipped the middle segment of this fenguli thing did i miss anything (laughs) you didn't no because i skipped it too but i don't know that that guy was weird like i had like no charisma but the production design was amazing (laughs) through the fucking roof right i want to do a whole episode on whatever that was it's okay i got i gotta look this up after this because unfortunately i I definitely have a uh a version from that, that anchor Bay DVD. And um, yeah, I'm sorry you all had to suffer. Um, basement bargain, Ben Svengoolie who apparently had very good production design. So I, I did not that. know that there was still, yeah, I didn't realize there were still people out there trying to be like Svengoolie or Joe Bob Briggs or whoever. Like I thought that there was like, it was a legacy type thing. You were grandfathered into being a late night TV host at this point. Well, I, I would say coming back around to our initial discussion, that's another way to find movies is like ha- have these people, if they want to do it, you know, more power to them. And if it means that they can help people find movies like Penn, bravo, the system's working. You know, the only thing that I'll add to that is I don't have any extra thoughts on how it's discovered. I just hope that when folks discover it, that they understand what it is they're watching. Uh, Cause there's a lot of stuff here that makes for really good 10 second clips, right? Like there is a kid <laughs> watching a nurse fuck an anatomically correct medical doll, right? That is, that is camp in excess to the highest degree, but as we've discussed kind of ad nauseum here, the beating heart of this film is so sad and it's, it's about such a dysfunctional family and it does not, it is not cheap. It's not a, it's not a film that does any, like there are no cheap moments between characters in this movie. No, everything that it does is earned. And so I hope that it doesn't become one of those like cult classics that goes the MST three K route. And everybody's like, Oh, look at this ridiculous movie. Cause I think that this is, has more heart than 90% of the horror that I've seen even from the last 10 years or so. I'm, I'm really enamored with it. Well, I'm, I'm very glad that I was able to, to, to be the person that brought that to you. But I mean, I, I, I get it. It's like that first, 
that first hard cut when uh, Leon reveals that he has put skin and hair on on Pen, it's like okay, I totally see people taking that at a at a at a camp value um, yeah. because it is bizarre and shocking and weird and and funny. Like it is partially funny, but it's you know that tragic comedy kind of funny. Um, but I think that they're like you're saying there will always be people that they just can't get over their own irony uh, of movies. But I think the majority of people can actually see that this is a really mature, difficult, uh, scary and affecting little tragic horror movie. And I, I think once, once whoever it is that can bless us with a nice restoration for it, I think you'll see that there is a much bigger audience out there for Penn than people would think. Uh, Brad Henderson, if you're listening, uh, come on down. You are the next contestant on <laughs> The Pin is Right. Oh, I, would, get... I wouldn't be surprised if he's already on this one, if I'm being <laughs> honest. Yeah. He's going to get so tired is. of me telling him. It's like, oh, by the way, can you look at the, find this one? <laughs> I'm always telling him. So <laughs> Nice. Well, Drew, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was You brought us a great film. It was great to have the conversation we did about it. Um, thank you. For folks that want to learn more about the kind of stuff that you're covering on John revision and on um, Finn. Hold on, Finn. Help me out here. Finn Flicks. Finn Flicks. Thank yeah. you. And the uh, other podcasts that are part of your network. Uh, where can they find that? Where are places people can go to follow you on social media? Yeah, I mean, uh, genrevision.com is going to be your best thing. You know, we put out an episode practically every week for the last I don't know how many years. Um, uh, we're so we're doing some of the curation for you if you just want to help you know, find movies or hear fun discussions about movies because we also do a segment on every genre vision episode called the shelf where we pick a, a movie to pair with our main topic. So it's like, Hey, you know, yeah, we talked about this, but if you want something a little bit more, or maybe something that's out of the box, it's there. Um, genre vision.com is going to be the way to do it. You can follow me on Twitter at drew Deach. Um, I'm also there on a blue sky, same thing. Um, and uh, yeah, you can check out my aquatic creature feature podcast fin Flicks, which is also available at genre vision um we're currently neck deep in in season three production for it um I, it's you know something very 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 proud of those episodes so if that's the kind of stuff you like aquatic creature features check that out and uh yeah genre is the best way to find out what i'm doing every week uh, drew i'll ask you one quick follow-up question here for podcasts that are long running and that have a lot of episodes it can sometimes be intimidating to know where to start to get a flavor of it is there an episode of genre vision that you particularly recommend for new listeners well jumping off the back of this episode i would say go listen to our episode on the stepfather starring terry o'quinn um nice. a, a a wonderful movie that i had seen before but my co-host travis newton did not and uh, listening to his discovery of that movie is one of the joys i've had of doing that show um yeah, I would say the nice thing about it is you can check us out. We do theme months every month. So you can just find a theme that kind of tickles your fan. Like right now we're in the middle of Alien Invasion month. So nice. if you like Alien Invasion movies, go check that out. Um, you know, we do uh, uh, martial arts, you know, theme months. So I would say just kind of look for a theme, a genre or something that that would be of an interest to you. And then check out the movies we did that month. Or just if you have a very favorite movie that you love, just take a look. But uh, yeah, coming off of this one, I would say the stepfather. And that was part of the uh, scary parents theme month, which is one of the best theme months we've ever done. So uh, yeah, check that out. Love it. Start there. Donato, my friend, uh, you're, you're a busy, busy beaver once more. How do folks stay in touch with what you're working on? As always, you can follow me at Donato bomb on Twitter, letterboxd, Instagram, and blue sky. Those are my primaries until Twitter launches itself in the fucking sun. Um, <laughs> TikTok sometimes if you want to just follow my my weird adventures into beer and food and and, and pretty much travel. And yeah, just uh, follow those. And I'm gonna tweet out reviews for things like Cobweb and Mother May I. And I'm looking forward lot. to Cobweb. I hope. Yeah, it's I'm, uh, I'm looking, forward, looking forward to your take. It's interesting. No, no spoilers. It's no interesting. Spoilers. But yeah, I, I, I will. I will say I'm also on Letterboxd if anyone wants to follow me and see my uh, my chaos star rating system, um, in which I use no half stars. Uh, <laughs> that is to, that's that it. Is, yeah, no, stressed me no. out. My shoulders went up involuntarily. When you said <laughs> exactly. That. It's no. a it's a it's chaos. I love it. I, I hate it. No. So yeah. <laughs> As for myself, you can follow me on uh, social media. My current rule is that I can retweet and reply on Twitter, but I cannot post. I will only be doing that on Blue Sky. It's just a way 
for me to help make sense of what has become a rather terrible app. So yes. <laughs> if you want to see what I'm reading and what I'm engaging with, it makes me really excited. Keep following me on Twitter. It's Matt Monagle and then Monagle at Blue Sky. If you want to have me talk about the things that are important to me, which is typically just my alien shelf in the background and whatever the fuck else I'm working on. <laughs> um, Drew, great to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. We'll hope to have you back soon. I would love it. This was an absolute joy. You guys are awesome. And uh, thank you, listeners. Donato, take us out. Don't fuck your sister and write rainbow a tree. <laughs> this is kind of fun. That was our longest yet.